step inside the walls of the 25-year leader in classic and custom boat restorations. Watch as the meticulous craftsmen use the most advanced materials and processes in the industry to restore, repair, and build some of the most beautiful boats on the water, including their own Matan Classic Collection. Hi folks, I'm Mike Varelli. Here at Matan, we custom build classic style vessels and perform restorations on boats we refer to as the family heirloom. We also take on fiberglass repairs sent to us from across the country with the client's confidence that vessel will be returned better than new. From the very beginning, our work was described as meticulous and I often told to be anal retentive. And this is Making It Matan. Hello, and welcome back to Making It Matan. Hope you enjoyed our last episode when we took a break away from the current projects and took off to Miami. To pick up a Boston Whaler 27 Outrage, which is a future restoration project we'll be getting into later this year. Now, let's get back to the build to the two Matan Classic Collection Pelham Bay 21s. In the first episode of this series, we went through the manufacturing process of the 221 hull parts, which is one of the four individual fiberglass parts we needed to build these boats. To catch up on that episode, visit our new website, makingitmatan.com, where you can stream not just the last episode, but all past episodes. And feel free to visit our Instagram page and YouTube channel. Keep up with the past and present projects going on at Matan. This week, we're gonna get into the custom fabrication of the deck liner and the gunnel caps. Each set of these parts were customized to accommodate different fixtures and accessories of these two very different 21s. Along with these customizations, we were also making some permanent updates to the Pelham Bay model. Always trying to make things better is actually a standard practice in the semi-custom boat building world. At the time of these builds, we already built two Pelham Bay 21s. Hull one was finished off as our Heritage Edition, displaying the elegant, bright work interior using both mahogany and teak details. Hull 2 was finished as a special edition model, similar to one of the 21s being built in this series. One of the updates that came to us almost immediately was permanently raised the transom to 25 inches, up from the original 20 inch transom that we replicated from the classic. That fabrication you'll see us get into next episode when we're gluing and bonding the three main components together. In this episode, we're gonna update the design of the rigging tube on the deck liner. We did this while we were fabricating and laminating the core materials used under the deck to bond the above deck fixtures and hardware. On the gunnel cap part, we raised the back seating area, making for a much more comfortable seating position, as well adding to a better aesthetic look to go along with the raised transom. All of which we'll get into when we return. Hello, we're back, and let's get right into the first part of the fabrication to the deck liner which is the fabrication and fiberglass of the PVC rigging tube. With the classics, they did in fact have a rigging tube. However, the design and the material created two flaws. The first were the rigging wells that connected the two ends of the rigging tube. The wells 
easily let water drain into the rigging tubes, leaving the rigging and the electrical of the vessel sitting in water. The standing water caused a second issue. Since the rigging tubes were made out of tin back then, in fact, very similar to tin stovepipe, you can only imagine it rotted out very quickly, letting water intrude into the foam of the boat very early on in its lifetime. We corrected the issue by number one, using PVC pipe. Number two, having the rigging tubes protrude up eight to 10 inches above the deck. And number three, raising the transom. With a higher transom and a larger, deeper motor well, it drastically limited the amount of water making it into the boat. Whether by backing down on a fish or another boat's weight when you're anchored or beached at your favorite hangout spot. After fabricating the rigging tubes, we handed it off to Dennis and Scotty so they can structurally glass the rigging tubes in place. When we flip the deck over, we'll do the cosmetic fiberglass and fairing around both ends of the tube. While Dennis and Scott fabricated the rigging tubes on both decks, I was busy fabricating the necessary core material needed in the different areas of the deck liner. I did this by making a template of the entire deck before we flipped it over. I did one model configuration in one color, another model configuration in another color. I was able to copy off my template the exact location, the type of core used in that location, and the shape I would need to fabricate. Depending on whether we were screwing a fastener, through bolting the fastener, determine what core material we would be using in that area. When we use screws to fasten, say, the main deck hatch, we used one inch, an inch and a half Penske board. In areas that we'd be using a machine screw, involving drilling and tapping of the material, we would use G10 composite. I fabricated the core pieces for both decks and laid them in the location for Scotty and Dennis to glue and glass in place. I kind of screwed Scotty a little bit by getting ahead of myself and having them glass the rigging tubes in place before installing the strips of Penske board along the inner hatch flange that we'd be screwing our main deck hatch into. After the core was glued and fiberglassed in place, the men sanded the lamination in the surrounding areas and applied multiple coats of epoxy-based bilge coat. Masking off the area of the bottom of the deck in the bonding location of the stringers. This will give the methaculite a laminate to laminate bond. We then flip the deck parts over to get the cosmetic fabrication around the rig and tubes complete, which we'll touch upon when we return. So stay tuned. We're back. After flipping the deck over, we filled up the cavities around the protruding rigging tubes with flotation foam. Then it sanded down the foam and shaped it to the surrounding details of the deck. We then laminated multiple layers of one ounce mat around the rigging tubes in the deck details. We fared the area out and readied the surfaces for Scotty to later gel coat. While he and Scotty were finishing up, on the other side of the shop, Robert began mapping out his cut lines to make precision cuts so we can raise the whole aft seating section in one piece. Robert suited up, went in, made his cuts, raising the section and temporarily clamping and screwing it in place. 
Dennis and Scott bevel ground out the cut lines in both the gunnel caps. Fiberglass in the seams. Finishing up the fairing. And leaving the area ready for final primer and gel coat. The special edition gunnel cap at this point had no further fabrications to be done except for the fabrication and lamination of the under gunnel cord sections that could be later used for rod holders or a brush rack. However, the Sportfish model gunnel cap was a different story. Like the special edition, it too had under gunnel cord sections, but eight of them on each side to support the mahogany plank gunnel boards. These were fabricated from inch and a half Penske board and laminated to the inner gunnel with multiple layers of 1708, finished in a couple of layers of one ounce mat. They then prepared the underneath surfaces for coating and applied multiple coats of gel coat. There were two other, not major, but detailed fabrications that needed to be done to the Sport Fish's gunnel cap. One came from the request of our client, which was to close off the two aft transom hatches. We cut one inch, four pound density foam to the shape of the hatch openings. Cut multiple layers of 1708, individually tapered sizes. set up two separate vacuum infusions to laminate each opening separately while laminating both the underside and the top at the same time. I then handed it off to Scotty to do his thing. Shape and fare the area like it came out of the mold that way. Checking in with Scotty Van Boozelstein. What's up, bud? He's got his head to that man. He doesn't even know I'm standing here. This is an excellent example of semi-custom boat building. It isn't just a matter of having the ability to fabricate a change, it's the skill to make that change look flawless. This comes from years of doing major fiberglass repairs and returning boats to our customers looking brand new. The damage area not even able to be detected. Heck, it's a lot easier making something that wasn't broken or busted up in the first place look perfect than starting with something that looks like it hit everything but the lottery. Earlier, while the gunnel lid was still flipped upside down, we beefed up a large section of the forward gunnel deck for the installation of the Minkota trolling motor. notice on a lot of trolling motor applications, the trolling motor is mounted on an angle, which on most boats makes sense because you wouldn't want that trolling motor in your way when you're not using it. Well, between the depth of the forward deck on the gunnel cap and a bit of luck on our end, we were able to mount the trolling motor straight on right down the center of the bow without losing any deck space. And even better, the hatches for the anchor locker open perfectly, just missing that trolling motor with it in its stowage position. In order to mount the trolling motor base, we filled in the forward detail of the gunnel cap right where the navigation light mounts. We did this by grinding back the recessed detail cutting and shaping a piece of one inch Penske board, laminating and fairing the detail, and readying that area for the application of gel coat, which we will get into when we return. And we're back. 
With the three major fiberglass components completed, we are ready to glue the parts together, and that started with bonding the deck line apart to the hull part. The process of gluing the deck liner to the hull was intense and time consuming. Well, yes, time consuming, but we only had less than an hour to get it done. But with seven men working together, that's seven man hours to glue two of these parts together. You've heard me mention many times that Thaculate is the strongest adhesive used in the industry. And yes, it's very expensive. And we're gonna mix up nearly 10 gallons to glue these parts together. Methaculite gains more strength with the thickness of the application. Its strongest bonding strength is at two inches. Early on when we were dry fitting the deck liners to each corresponding hull, we took into consideration the distance between the bottom of the deck and the height of the stringer system ensuring that we had at least one inch of distance between the two parts. We incorporated two important details in crucial bonding areas, such as the hull to deck joint and the structural bonding surfaces of the stringers and the underneath of the deck. The first is something I forgot to point out during the construction of the hull. That is the inch and a half strip of Penske board that we fiberglass to the inside of the hull to deck joint. Boys just got done putting two layers of 1708 tabbing around the hull to deck joint. Now that Penske board's been glued in with our super putty. Now blast has become definitely part of the hull. We routed a trough a half an inch deep, giving us a full one inch of bonding surface along the hull to deck joint. There's the trough, you can see it really good right there. Well, we do that trough so when the hull to deck comes down, it fits really nice, but you see how you would smush out all your product and you wouldn't get a bond, so we put a half inch trough by a half inch trough, knowing that we now have the thickness of the putty that we need. The Penske board will now be there when we drill and screw the rubber rail on but we'll talk about that during the assembly stage. With replacing the rivets with screws and having our inch and a half Penske board laminated to the hull to deck joint, using one inch screws to caulk prior to be putting on, as well as the gasket, eliminates any possibility of water ever getting in through the hull to deck joint. The other important detail was the strip of one inch foam core we hot glued to the inside and outside of the stringers. Installing these strips of foam ensured that we'd have a full one inch thick block of methaculite bonding the entire surface of the stringer to the deck. This eliminates the very expensive methaculite from mushrooming out over the sides of the stringers into the bows of the boat, never to be seen again, like we've seen on a lot of boats. Some use this mystery putty. I swear to God, I think they swept up dust in the shop, mixed it with resin, and made their own putty. Working like a team, we began to mix up gallon after gallon of the two-part methaculite adhesive, handing the mixed gallons off to be troweled in place using the foam strips as indicators on how much material we needed to apply. Precision. We started in the inside of the hull and worked our way to the hull to deck joint, making sure we filled the routed trough with methacolite, leaving plenty to make the bond. clamped off the hull to deck joint and applied light pressure to the inside of the liner. Cleaned up around the deck joint and did it all over again on the second 21. We gave the methacolite a full day to dry and then spent a few hours 
prepping the perimeter of the hull to deck joint by grinding the surface down to laminate. Because remember, methaculite bonds the best laminate to laminate. Going through a very similar process and working as a team, we bonded the gunnel cap to the deck liner, giving ourselves what now looks like a boat. And we're gonna have to leave it there because we are out of time. Join me on the next episode when we complete the transom fabrication and go through the gel coat finishing process to get both these 21s ready for assembly. On the road to building them Matan. Thank you, I'm Mike Borelli. See you next time on Making It Matan.